Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And as ever, in order to get as many people in as possible, short and succinct questions and answers to match would be appreciated. Question number one is Claire Baker. Um, President officer, um, this is my eighth question in as many weeks, and now we all know why. Um, I'll take what might be the last opportunity for a while to ask the Cabinet Secretary whether it will provide an update on its progress in closing the educational attainment gap in the Mid Scotland and Fife region. Cabinet Secretary. President officer, the Lever attainment data for Clackmannanshire, Fife, Perth and Kinross and Stirling local authority areas, which are within the Mid Scotland and Fife region, show a mixed picture in terms of progress in closing the educational gap. On some indicators in some areas, there is evidence of good progress in narrowing the gap over the past three years, while some other indicators the gap has increased slightly. Any widening of the gap is unacceptable, and that is why everyone involved in Scottish education needs to relentlessly focus their efforts on reducing the impact of deprivation on educational outcomes. The Government has made clear its commitment to eradicating the gap through the launch of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, backed by the £100 million Attainment Scotland Fund. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Um, this week, the Fairer Fife Commission published its report, which sets out a plan for tackling inequality and providing more opportunities within Fife, and it has specific proposals on addressing the educational attainment gap. And while six Fife primary schools are receiving support from the attainment fund, this does not do enough to meet the challenge. So will the Cabinet Secretary commit to fully considering the Fairer Fife Commission's report and work with Fife Council to ensure they have the resources to make the positive changes the report is outlining. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, as the member uh, rightly identifies, uh, there will be six schools in Fife that will benefit from the uh, Attainment Scotland Fund, uh, and Scottish Government uh, is working very close uh, with Fife and the uh, Attainment Advisors with regards to the bids uh, that have come from those schools uh, in and around the improvement plans and the improvement plans that have come from Fife uh, are indeed uh, very interesting and it's a huge focus on parental engagement which is good uh, and I of course uh, will look at the, the very specific proposals from Fife in relation to their very recent report uh, with great interest. Uh, supplementary Liz Smith please. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to you. I thought my name might just be lucky today. <laughs> Could the Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber what criteria will be used to measure the progress made by the seven schools in Mid-Scotland and Fife which are receiving money from the Attainment Scotland Fund over the next four years and whether these criteria will be different from the other schools not receiving this financial assistance? Cabinet Secretary. There will be um, broad similarities but the, as you would expect there will be similar uh, differences uh, in the criteria as well given uh, that the seven uh, attainment challenge local authorities and the attainment challenge schools are all working on very uh, individual bespoke uh, improvement plans so there will be similarities but there will of course uh, be differences and George Adam Thank you, President Officer. Uh, during the Cabinet Secretary's answer to Claire Baker, she mentioned attainment advisors. Could she possibly give us an update uh, on the situation with our attainment advisors nationally? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the full team of 32 attainment advisors has now been identified and put in place uh, with <coughs> each local authority having a named advisor. Thank you. Question number two, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update in progress with Ayrshire College's Kilmarnock campus project. Cabinet Secretary Angel Constance. The £53 million project is progressing well and is scheduled to be delivered on time and operational uh, by summer 2016. Uh, to date, the project has created over 550 employment opportunities and eight apprenticeships. Molly Coffey. Can I th thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Does she agree with me that that level of investment in the new college campus will not only be a massive boost for students and staff, but for the town of Kilmarnock too? And would she outline the impact that it can have in making and providing better opportunities for employment in the area? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, as I have already indicated to the member, the, the project so far has created hundreds of uh, employment opportunities. Uh, further to this, I also understand that a number of training opportunities have been provided for those uh, working on the project, with employees securing uh, further qualifications in areas such as advanced health and safety uh, and um, leadership and management. And of course, once complete, the new campus will accommodate 
approximately 5,000 students um, providing sector leading facilities uh, across uh, the curriculum. And it's also worth noting, uh, in terms of the benefits uh, for the, the town of Kilmarnock, the project was uh, awarded BREAM excellent rating uh, at the design stage, uh, and that's the highest award uh, given under this scheme. Thank you. Question number three, Gavin Brown. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to publish its full analysis of the risk of Office for National Statistics reclassification for universities for the proposed Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, as Mr Brown will recall, at the Finance Committee's meeting on the 16th of September, and in relation to the analysis conducted by the Scottish Government on this matter, he asked, can the committee please see some of that work? This was subsequently provided to committee in a letter from me uh, dated the 5th of October. And the report to the Education and Culture Committee from the Finance Committee dated 8th of October. Finance Committee recommended that the full analysis is published in advance of the Parliament being asked to vote on the bill at stage one. Uh, as noted at the Education and Culture Committee on the 10th of November, the Scottish Government will write to both committees on this matter prior to the stage one debate in January. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful for the answer. If all the analysis has been done, and I was told in September it had been done months previously, what is the delay in publishing the full analysis? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say to Mr Brown there is absolutely no delay uh, in publishing the full analysis. The commitment that I have given to uh, both committees is indeed uh, compliant with the request that was made uh, of myself as Cabinet Secretary that that information uh, would be uh, published prior to stage one uh, and that indeed uh, will happen. Uh, Mr Brown will also be aware that we have received lengthy and detailed correspondence from University of Scotland an important stakeholder and that I also gave a commitment to the Education Committee uh, to respond to that as well. So there will be um, a broad range of matters uh, that my officials will respond to committee uh, on my behalf, uh, encapsulating uh, the analysis that we have already done because central to our consideration uh, throughout the development of this bill uh, has been classification issues, but we also uh, have other matters to consider uh, further detailed matters uh, raised by important stakeholders and indeed members of this chamber to respond to also. Thank you. Supplementary, Ian Gray. Um, when uh, this uh, bill has been previously discussed and debated, the Cabinet Secretary has undertaken to amend the bill as brought forward in order to reduce the ONS reclassification risk. When will she provide us with some detail of exactly how she intends to do that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would expect to be in a position to do that at the turn of the year as we progress with the, the, the next stage of uh, the bill. It is important to stress that the government's position is and remains uh, that there is nothing in this bill that increases uh, the risk of reclassification, uh, but we are collegiate and intend to work in partnership with members across this chamber and indeed stakeholders uh, to reassure them of any concerns that they have. Thank you. Question number four, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that all children and young people requiring regular medication and medical assistance at school have these needs met. Minister Alistair Allen. NHS boards are responsible for securing the medical inspection, uh, the medical supervision and treatment of pupils in schools. In practice, local authorities help NHS boards to discharge these responsibilities. Guidance on the, administra the administration of medicines was published in 2001 to support NHS boards, local authorities and schools to develop policies on managing health care in schools. Thank you, Malcolm Chisholm. That answer, but is he aware that the current uh, guidance to which he referred uh, has been extensively ignored according to recent research from the Office of the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People? Isn't it time that the right to essential medication and medical assistance in school was put on a statutory footing? Minister? Well, of course, the, the guidance in existence dates from 2001, and there is an acceptance that that guidance needs to be refreshed. Uh, there has been a group looking at this. Uh, I accept also that there has been uh, some delay, or it's taken longer than anticipated, uh, for that group to reach its conclusions. However, it reconvened on the 25th of November uh, with the plans for re revised guidance to be issued uh, and the expectation that new guidance, which will have been informed 
um, by a broad range of, uh, of opinion and expert uh, knowledge across the sector uh, will be uh, in place ready for publication in the summer of next year. Thank you. Question number five, Graeme Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it considers the named person provision in the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 will assist families with children with autism. Minister Aileen Campbell. The named person will have a key role in supporting families with children with autism. As the single point of contact, the named person will be well placed to, where necessary, provide direct advice and support to the child and family or help them access other services. The named person was originally developed so families would not have to repeat their stories unnecessarily to professionals and ensure that there was better coordination across services to support the needs of their children. It is the kind of assistance we know that families with children with autism need. The same principles encouraging early intervention, working with children, young people and families and seeing a child's whole well-being underlie the Scottish strategy for autism. Launched in November 2011, this is our framework for improving autism services, provision and access to those services across Scotland. Graeme Tee. Uh, grateful to the Minister for that uh, answer. As the Minister is aware, Angus is one of several councils in Scotland to already operate a single point of contact scheme for parents. And my experience earlier this year of listening to parents of autistic children proactively extol the virtues of this setup as anything to go by, and it obviously finds favour with those who have direct experience of it. That being the case, who does she think we should be listening to on the named person issue? Parents who know what they're talking about are scaremongering Tories who shamefully twisted this issue in pursuit of party political gain. Minister, could you pull your microphone round? We couldn't hear you earlier. Oh, sorry, I apologise. Eh, I'm glad the member has taken the chance to flag up the positive benefits of the named person and to relay to the Parliament that this message came from parents themselves. This policy was developed in response to what, to what parents told us they needed. And I also know that Angus Council are to be applauded on their commitment to the implementation of getting it right for every child. And in response to Mr Day's question whether I'll listen to parents he's met or the Tories, it'll be the parents every time. Question number six, Neil Bibby. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the learning environment for college students in the West Scotland region. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance, please. Side officer, the Scottish Funding Council has provided West College Scotland with £70,000 to help it develop a business case outlining options for the Greenock campus. The college is also working on a broader estate strategy, which will include the Paisley campus. Neil Bibby. Uh, whilst other areas may have had their fair share of capital funding for colleges, the West uh, Scotland has not. There has been no significant investment in either the Paisley or Greenock campuses at West College Scotland for a number of years. I have spoken to students at the college who believe new or refurbished buildings are badly needed and I know the college has made it quite clear they require additional investment in the estate. Given this and what the Minister says earlier, will the Minister give a commitment to consider the compelling case uh, for more capital investment at West College Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, President Officer, it is the Funding Council that gives uh, consideration to these matters uh, as opposed to uh, Ministers. Uh, but what I can say is that the Scottish Government is committed to supporting all colleges, uh, including those in the uh, West Scotland region, to invest uh, in their estates. Uh, as I mentioned in my original uh, answer, the Funding Council has been in discussion uh, with West College Scotland and provided some funding, £70,000, to help it develop a business case uh, outlining options uh, for the Greenock campus and also, as I say, the college is working on the, a broader estate strategy which will include the Paisley campus uh, and uh, I am assured that Greenock and Paisley uh, are given high priority by the Funding Council uh, in their capital plans. Thank you. Question number seven, Claire Adamson. Sir Chas, the Scottish Government, what it is doing to support children in kinship care? Minister Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government recognises the important and selfless role played by kinship carers in providing secure, stable and nurturing homes for children and young people when they are no longer able to live with their birth parents. We believe that kinship carers who take on this responsibility are providing a valuable service and should be supported in carrying out this role. This is why we have introduced new kinship care support provisions in the Children and Young People Act to support eligible kinship carers of non-looked-after children who hold a kinship care order. These children are not in care and by supporting families in this way, many children will avoid formal care completely. The new legislative provision build on the existing provisions for looked after children in kinship care set out in the Looked After Children Regulations 2009. In agreement with COSLA, we have invested £10.1 million and met our commitment to kinship care families by delivering parity of allowances with those in foster care. 
Our policies are delivering real benefits for some of Scotland's most vulnerable children and families. Claire Adamson. I thank the Minister um, for her answer. And the, the investment of £10.1 million is, is most welcome, particularly in local authorities in my, in my area, North South Lanarkshire and Falkirk councils, where families will see a real benefit. Can I ask the Minister, in light especially of the rollout of universal credit, um, if any of this fund will go to um, income maximisation for Kingsett carers? Elaine Campbell. Um, I can tell the member that, in addition to the points that I raised in her original question, that we continue to fund Citizen Advice Scotland to provide support and welfare benefit checks to ensure that kinship carers are receiving all they are entitled to. Um, we are, have provided them also with extra funding uh, to assist local authorities and kinship carers with the implementation of the revised allowances in the initial stages of the implementation of that new policy. In addition to support all kinship carers, we also fund the National Advice and Support Service and we have also awarded via the Strategic Funding Partnership Grant uh, to, uh, finances to Mentor UK to deliver projects that help break the intergenerational cycle of children becoming looked after and have poorer outcomes. Also, it may be of uh, note to Ms. Ad uh, Ms Adams that I met with kinship carers from South Lanarkshire in my constituency. That group also included kinship carers from North Lanarkshire and Glasgow. Uh, we are there also finding ways in which they can support one another. Uh, and I would certainly recommend that uh, Claire Adams uh, would visit uh, that group uh, because they are uh, inspirational in what they do to provide uh, security for those vulnerable children. Thank you. Question number eight, James Stornan. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support looked after children. Minister Aileen Campbell. Outcomes are improving for looked after children in education and <clears throat> positive destinations on leaving school and in numbers adopted, but we absolutely need to accelerate the progress. And that's why I launched the Scottish Government's Looked After Children and Young People strategy at the Improving Outcomes for Looked After Children con conference last week. The strategy builds on provisions in the Children and Young People Act. Through that, the Scottish Government has increased support to kinship care families and families on the edge of care, increased the number of corporate parents, and put Scotland's adoption register on a statutory basis. We have also enabled young people to remain in their care setting up to the age of 21 and extended support for care leavers. The strategy calls on the sector to build on this and accelerate progress. It sets out a range of actions that are clear and specific to support families early to prevent children becoming looked after, to help children have a safe, secure, nurturing permanent home and to make sure every child receives the best possible care and support. The strategy has been welcomed by the sector who Care Scotland said the government has continued to listen to care experienced young people and their views have been represented within this strategy. Uh, and for the benefit of other members, this strategy is available on the government website and copies are also available in SPICE. James Stornan. I thank the Minister for that lengthy answer. Could uh, the Minister tell me is there any more that could be done in regards to uh, raising the attainment of looked after children? Minister. Um, I thank the member for his uh, question. We are uh, starting to see attainment improving and the gap between looked after school leavers and other school leavers narrowing and the proportion of looked after school leavers with at least one qualification at SCQF level five or better has increased from 28% in 2011-12 to 40% in 13-14. And the proportion going into positive destinations nine months after leaving school has also increased from 67% in 2012-13 to 73% in 13-14. But the most important thing we can do to raise attainment of looked after children is to ensure that they are safe, secure, caring, uh, and people support, support them. Our looked after strategy sets out how we aim to do this. For example, through the Children and Young People Act, we've extended the age that young people can remain in their care setting. And we know that young people who leave care aged 17 and 18 achieve far higher attainment than those who leave care aged uh, 16. So I hope that gives and provides reassurance that amongst all of those uh, policies and initiatives that we're doing our best and working very hard to make sure that those children uh, attain the same level as their non-looked after peers. Thank you. Before I call supplementaries, I've been asked to request that all members speak clearly into their microphones. Some members are having difficulty hearing this afternoon. Uh, supplementary from Cara Hilton, please. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, in reference to the figures um, that have been referred to by the Minister um, on educational outcomes for looked after school leavers, I am concerned by the fact that just 8 per cent of looked after children at home with parents are achieving at least one qualification at SCQF level 5 or better. And indeed, concerned too about the figure for looked after children in local authority accommodation, which isn't much better at just 21 per cent. 
and this obviously compares to 84 per cent of all school leavers. Um, so I take um, on board what the Minister has just said, but what additional steps will the Scottish Government take to address this really wide gap between looked after children and the rest of our country's school leavers? Minister. Uh, and I absolutely share Cara Hilton's concerns. That's why the Looked After Her strategy that we published last week had a clear uh, uh, aspiration to do better by the children who are looked after at home. And I would certainly recommend that Cara Hilton, uh, because she expresses those, uh, oh, she's got the copy there, good. Um, but um, it, what, one of the things that we need to do amongst that is one of the uh, aims we have is to provide a, a, a mentor and, and operate a national mentoring scheme to provide someone who isn't paid to look after or look out for the needs of that child, but takes an interest in that child's life because we know ultimately that, in, that we can have processes and policies but actually it's relationships that make a difference for these children and that's why we're uh, shining a real spotlight about making sure that people don't park these children in uh, these settings but actually make sure that there is a meaning to having a child looked after at home but absolutely uh, bolstering their uh, support by uh, rolling out the national mentoring scheme and happy to continue that dialogue with Cara Hilton who I recognise has an interest in this topic. Thank you and briefly Matt Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Next week, we will move amendments to the Education Bill, which will place a duty on the inspection regime to look particularly at how schools are tackling the attainment gap for looked-after children. Does the, the Minister support um, that increased focus on looked-after children by the school and inspection regime? And will the Scottish Government support those amendments at committee next week? Minister? Within our... Uh uh, looked after children refresh strategy it's been made very clear that we're going to strain every sinew to make sure that we do best by these children who we have a corporate parenting responsibility for uh, and by that we'll uh, certainly look in, at any of those uh, amendments that come uh, our way but certainly uh, make no mistake we these are our bairns uh, we have improved uh, the corporate parenting responsibilities and increase the number of people who have a responsibility for these children and we'll take cognizance of the points that Mark Griffin has made when they come Thank you. Question number nine, Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how its Education Directorate monitors the implementation of the educational aspects of the autism strategy. Alistair The Education Directorate monitors the implementation of the strategy through educational developments. The Scottish Government funded the Autism Toolbox website, which was launched on the 29th of April 2014. The toolbox provides a resource for education staff in schools. Under the Additional Support for Learning Act 2004, education authorities are required to identify, meet and keep under review the additional support needs of all their pupils and to tailor provision according to their individual circumstances. To help teachers and education support staff meet the needs of pupils with autism, the Autism Toolbox website identifies best practice for all education staff in schools to help support pupils with autism. Thank you, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to thank the Minister, uh, could I say to the Minister that there is a concern amongst parents in my own constituency that whilst in theory the autism strategy is welcome, the practice is not always as good as it should be. Uh, can the Minister give some comfort that the training aspect of the strategy is being monitored, recorded and assessed by the government and that the theory in this regard can be translated into frontline action. Minister. Well, as I mentioned, uh, Education Scotland do uh, monitor uh, issues uh, around uh, the practice uh, involving, uh, I'm sure, training uh, and uh, they do take seriously uh, in ensuring that this is not merely a a strategy but is something that works on the ground. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, operation locally, uh, I'm very happy to hear from the member if she uh, has any particular issues she, she wishes to raise about that. Thank you. Supplementary. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, um, parents I met this week told me that the key problem for them is a lack of access to child mental health services. So how will the Minister address the fact that many children are simply not able to attend school at all because there's no educational support until a child has received diagnosis? And this can take up to two years. Minister. Well, uh, I, I certainly uh, liaise closely with health colleagues around uh, these issues for whom some of the, the statutory responsibility lies. Uh, but uh, uh, the, what I can say certainly uh, is that the, the government is uh, determined to ensure that everyone who has uh, need uh, of, of access or referral uh, to mental health specialists uh, enjoys that. Uh, and we work with local authorities and with health boards to achieve that. 
Many thanks. Questions number 10 and 11 have been withdrawn, uh, both for with satisfactory explanations. So I now turn to question number 12, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the possible implementation of a new EU directive on the movement of non-EU students and researchers. Minister Alistair Allen. The UK Government has uh, not uh, opted into this directive. The Scottish Government values the contribution made by non-EU students and researchers and will continue to press for an immigration system that meets Scotland's needs. Roger Campbell. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, he will be aware that the European Parliament informally approved the new directive very recently, but does he agree with me that the increased movement of non-EU national students and researchers would benefit Scotland's higher and further education institutions and the interest of Scotland as a whole? Minister. I can fully uh, agree with the member that uh, the, uh, the flow of international students clearly uh, benefit Scotland and of course uh, it's uh, an issue that we've raised on numerous occasions with the UK government with respect specifically to the uh, post-study work visa uh, and uh, there is pretty much uh, universal pretty much unanimous uh, agreement with uh, uh, the Scottish government and across uh, the education sector uh, that the UK government is simply wrong in this matter. Thank you. Question number 13, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what implications are for Scottish universities of proposals in the UK Government's higher education green paper. Minister Australia. We are considering the proposals and assessing the implications for the higher education sector in Scotland to ensure there are no adverse consequences for our students or universities. Christian Allard. The Minister for his answer. As a UK proposal within the Green Paper includes establishing a new office for students for providers in England. How does this proposal impact on Scotland and does the Scottish Government have plans to replicate this? Minister. Well, the, the Green Paper uh, proposes that uh, the Office for Students uh, will take on the majority of HEFCE's responsibilities, including uh, the running of the TEF. Now, as part of the proposal, it suggests opening up the higher education sector in England to new providers by widening the range of providers with degree awarding powers. I have to say the approach uh, in Scotland is rather different to the proposed approach for England uh, and changes uh, in some respects uh, being proposed for higher education policy in England uh, we, have to be, we have to be aware of uh, because of the potential for a, a direct impact on Scotland. The Scottish Government, I would emphasise, does not support the marketisation of higher education and we firmly believe that access to higher education for all students should be based on the ability to learn rather than on the ability to pay. Thank you. Question number 14, Chick Brody. Thank you. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government what monitoring and evaluation <coughs> it has carried out of the reforms to the sector following the 2012 report of the Review of Further Education Governance in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. So, officer, in addition to routine monitoring and evaluation of college delivery through outcomes agreement and Education Scotland reviews, the Scottish Funding Council is currently carrying out two-year post-merger evaluations and these will be complete by next summer. Chick Brody. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for our answer. The review indicated that the changes to the funding and the move to outcome-driven measures meant a fundamental change to the collection and auditing of data. Can the Cabinet Secretary update the Parliament on the development and implementation of the new national IT management information system proposed at the time of the new college's structure? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the development of outcome agreements for the sector has shifted the focus to monitoring outcomes that are consistent with our reform priorities. Rather than introduce a, a new national management information system to support the regional college structure, uh, which was recommended by Professor Griggs in his review of governance, the priority has been to integrate existing systems in regions uh, where colleges have merged. The Funding Council will evaluate progress on systems integration as part of its forthcoming post-merger evaluations. Additionally, and in line with Audit Scotland's 2015 report, uh, the Funding Council is uh, also looking to improve how it reports colleges' progress against outcomes to support effective scrutiny of performance. 
Thank you. Supplementary, Mary Scanlon. <coughs> the report mentioned by Chick Brodie stated that the national harmonisation of pay and conditions of service would be completed by August 2014. So given that teachers are paid the same salary wherever they work in Scotland, why should lecturers throughout Scotland be paid over £5,000 per annum more than lecturers in the Highlands and Islands? What's being done to address this disparity? Cabinet Secretary. Sign off, sir. Uh, let me assure Mrs Scanlon by saying that the, the Scottish Government uh, remains uh, absolutely committed uh, to national bargaining in our uh, further education sector. Uh, however, we have always recognised that moving towards this approach uh, was always going to be challenging uh, given the level of change uh, that is required. And for this reason, we consider uh, this year to be a transitional year where we expect a willingness uh, on both sides to move things forward. Uh, not everything can be achieved quickly uh, or at once, uh, but it is a process that this government remains uh, committed to. Thank you. 15. Nigel Doyne, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what resources its Education Directorate provides to ensure that appropriate educational opportunities are put in place for offenders at the time of their release to ensure effective rehabilitation. Minister Alistair Allen. Scottish Prison Service has put in place a contract to deliver learning services across all public prisons. This is delivered by Fife College and New College Lanarkshire and includes onward referrals on request for individuals who wish to continue their learning engagement in the post-liberation period throughout uh, community-based learning services. Education Scotland continues to work closely with SPS to focus on improved community links for through care as part of a focus on improving those outcomes. I thank the Minister for that response. I wonder if he can tell me what's being done to encourage the uptake of that service and whether there's any evidence uh, of it improving outcomes, please. Minister. Well, I, I can assure the member that there certainly is uh, a great deal of active effort being uh, undertaken to uh, encourage uptake. SPS have also established a clear vision for their new through care support uh, officers who will uh, work directly with individuals to support them on the journey uh, towards uh, life in the community uh, and ensuring that that life is a productive life in the community. Thank you. Question number 16, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the President of NUS Scotland's evidence to the Education and Culture Committee that further education student support in Scotland is not fit for purpose. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, we have increased the student support budget by 29 per cent in real terms since 2006 7 uh, Support is now at a record high of over £105 million in college bursaries, childcare and discretionary funds. In 2016-17, we are removing the variance rule to ensure that all eligible students awarded a bursary are paid at the full rate. Uh, this addresses one of NUS Scotland's key concerns. Uh, but of course, we note the Education and Culture Committee's review of student support, and it makes sense to see the committee's conclusions before we decide on the next steps. Sarah Boyack. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, every year, colleges are underfunded for bursaries, and the Government has to provide additional funds in year. Will the Minister commit in this year's budget to fully fund FE student support right from the start? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member uh, may be aware, as she represents the, the Lothian region, uh, that uh, over this government's uh, term of office. Uh, in cash terms, the student support funds available to, for example, Edinburgh College uh, has increased by 66%. In terms of West Lothian College, uh, the cash terms increase over our terms of office is 112%. So we always act uh, to put the interests of students first and have made very serious commitments uh, to student support uh, in the FE sector. Uh, the member is right to acknowledge that uh, every time around this year that we do do uh, an in-year redistribution process uh, that is currently uh, ongoing for this year. Uh, but as with every uh, other year where there is a gap, uh, this government uh, works very hard uh, with Colleges Scotland uh, and the Funding Council to plug that gap. Um, and we will do so again in the way that we have done in the past. 
I think looking forward uh, to, to the future, um, we would recognise that some of the solutions that we have adopted to date uh, are fine for now, but we do want to address uh, student support uh, in the longer term and to ensure uh, that it's uh, more sustainable, and we'll do that as part of the 2016-17 budget discussions. Chick Brodie, briefly, please. Thank you. Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary outline what outcomes the SN this SSB Scottish Government has delivered for college students? Briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the college reform programme has been of great benefit uh, to students. We have seen, for example, the, the average hours of learning uh, per student has increased uh, by 59%. Uh, 14,000 more students uh, are successfully completing uh, full-time courses, uh, leading to uh, recognised qualifications. Uh, and I firmly believe that our focus uh, on skills for learning and skills for work that meet the needs of the local economy uh, is indeed the right approach. Very briefly, Ian Gray, please. In her evidence, the President of NUS Scotland also pointed out that the Government's extension of eligibility for EMA meant that some FE students would receive only £30 a week, whereas previously they would have received £90 a week in a bursary. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree, agree this is perverse and will she correct it? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm certainly taking that uh, piece of evidence uh, very seriously indeed. Uh, as we know, colleges at present have the discretion whether to offer uh, an educational maintenance allowance payment uh, or indeed uh, that the college bursary. Uh, I expect colleges to be making the, the right decisions for every young person, particularly those that are uh, young people that are parents themselves or estranged from their own parents or in receipt um, of welfare benefits. It is important to remember that the substantial majority of young people in college receive the higher bursary rate as opposed to the educational maintenance allowance. Um, but I will nonetheless uh, be looking at this uh, very carefully and will be taking the, uh, all of the evidence that is presented to the Education uh, and Culture Committee's review of student support, looking at that very seriously uh, indeed. We have always acted in the best interests of students, made improvements where we can, and nothing is going to change that for the future. We will continue to look for further improvements in partnership with NUS Scotland. 17, Claudia Beamish, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support and develop the Energy Skills Partnership and a shift to a low-carbon economy. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, making the transition to a low-carbon economy remains a significant importance to Scotland's economy, uh, and this has been reflected consistently uh, in the Government's economic strategies. Uh, specific funding levels for the Energy Skills Partnership is, of course, a matter uh, for the Scottish Funding Council. Claudia Beamish. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and well, I understand that, um, what those um, arrangements are. The Energy Skills Partnership is indeed a bridge between the college sector, government and industry bodies, working with key partners in renewables enterprise and skills development. In South Scotland, um, there is Dumfries and Galloway College and Air College and others that um, are developing adventurous courses in initial and on-the-job on training. And so will the Scottish Government uh, uh, make a commitment to uh, ensure that there is an assessment of the impact of these courses and how they are helping to move forward the, the new skills? Cabinet Secretary, as briefly as possible, I would it, like to call the next question. Uh, yes, I would certainly um, like to always see the Scottish Funding Council look at uh, impact. Uh, the member is quite right to uh, state that the Energy Skills Partnership is a very important bridge uh, between uh, our economy and our education system. Uh, one example of that would be how SDS has supported the Energy Skills Partnership to develop further wind turbine training hubs right across Scotland, including the development and delivery of wind turbine technician training at Forth Valley uh, College. But the member makes good points. Very briefly, question 18. Bruce Crawford, please. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how standardised assessment will be used in classrooms. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the new standardised assessments will provide a, a diagnostic child level assessment focusing on aspects of literacy and numeracy. Uh, they will be used alongside other sources of evidence to inform the professional judgment of teachers. Bruce Crawford. The, and the practice has already taken place in classrooms. So, what information do teachers already have available in classrooms to enable them to identify low-achieving pupils? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have always been uh, very clear, presiding officer, that 
the National Improvement Framework um, is not about uh, additional burden. It is about supporting uh, a clear, consistent and robust uh, picture of progress uh, across schools uh, in Scotland. And, you know, to answer Mr Crawford's question directly, we know that standardised assessments are used in different forums uh, in schools. And unlike many of the current tools, the new assessments will be aligned uh, to the Curriculum for Excellence, uh, making them more meaningful uh, to learners, teachers uh, and parents. And we are working very closely with unions, local authorities, teachers and parents uh, as we progress with this work. Thank you very much. That concludes questions this afternoon. Before we start the debate, I need to remind members that legal proceedings